Starship SN9 lifts off, falls, and eats pavement, but Elon's already got a fix for that. We'll debrief yesterday's 18th Starlink mission and discuss further missions to come. SpaceX's first 100% private passenger crew Dragon mission has been announced. If you're a lucky winner, you can be one of those passengers. The company shrugs off more legal drama and retires another founding father. We'll finish with today's honorable mention. I'm Kevin, and this is SpaceX in the News. Remember our Friday episode last week when uh, SpaceX was transporting SN10 down Highway 4? Yeah, what about it? Um, you remember that? Well, it arrived at its launch mount where it was promptly hoisted into position next to SN9. Elon Musk was there snapping pics of this historic event, the first time two starships held a meet and greet at the Boca Chica launch site. What's your name? What? At the time we expected SN9's launch to happen by then, at least by Monday, and it turns out SpaceX expected the same thing as well. But the FAA said nay to that noise. See, back before SN8's launch, SpaceX sought a waiver to exceed the maximum public risk set by government bureaucrats. And after the FAA denied said request and grounded Starship, SpaceX was like, fuck you, launch. Because of this legendary move on SpaceX's part, the government suspended further launches until investigations into the incident was completed, which was late Monday evening thus giving the company the green light to launch SN9. One. The rocket flew to an apogee of 10 clicks above sea level, flopped over on its belly. We've now transitioned to horizontal and beginning the subsonic test portion of the flight. And like its predecessor, Wiley coyoted it into the landing pad. You forgot the shoots, brah. Elon commenting, next time we will try the pull up method. However, everyone knows when in doubt, pull out. Again, the rud resulted from a Raptor engine that wouldn't light when it came time to go vertical. So when asked by Mad Overlord, for redundancy's sake, why not light all three engines instead of just two and just shut down the extra if all three light up? Elon replied they were too dumb. Was that sarcasm? No. Was that sarcasm? Yes. Was that sarcasm? Stop it! It was foolish of us not to start with three engines and immediately shut down one, as two are needed to land. And by default, the engine with the least lever, or lever if you prefer, would shut down if all three are good. If right now you're wondering why not just land with three good engines, well, it's because these Raptors are so powerful that using three would mean they would have to throttle them so far back, the engines would flame out from reaching their minimum throttle point. Elon has confirmed that these changes to the landing sequence will be implemented into SN10's test flight. Splat zone cleanup has already commenced, which is a shame. This is better art than anything I've seen this century. We don't make mistakes. We have happy accidents. On Thursday, engineers pressure tested the SN7.2 test tank for the second time, and this time to failure. The test lasted several hours, and the three millimeter thick stainless steel failed when pressure finally punctured through a couple sides in the hull spilling out liquid nitrogen. SpaceX continues to work on other Starships and Super Heavy boosters, and booster number one is officially over halfway completed. Elon gave an interview on the new Clubhouse app where he discussed the future steps to get to Mars and his current prediction on when humans will get there. Well, we've got to make a Starship fly, um, get, get to go to orbit and back repeatedly. And it can't just be fully reusable, it needs to be rapidly reusable because it doesn't take like several months of refurbishment between uh, flights. Right. Uh, and then you need to have uh, orbital refilling, so where you can uh, send the ship up to orbit, uh, then send uh, another ship up, dock with a transfer propellant, so that you can load up um, to being almost full with propellant and then go to Mars. And then one other, one last thing is on Mars, to you, you need local uh, propellant production. So I figure, you know, I don't know, uh, five and a half years. Now let's debrief this week's Starlink mission. On Thursday morning, SpaceX launched their 18th flock of Starlink satellites to orbit, and on a rocket that set a world record for fastest turnaround time of 27 days. The previous turnaround for a rocket took over a month to launch. This is important because rapid reusability is key to reducing the cost of traveling to space. And that booster landed for a fifth time, this time on the drone ship Of Course I Still Love You out in the Atlantic Ocean. The boss said this was a tough one due to high seas and wind an issue that almost caused the launch to scrub. 
And just so you know, all 60 satellites deployed successfully. The next Falcon 9 mission is Starlink 19, currently scheduled no earlier than February 7th at 4.31 a.m. Eastern at the uploading of this video. Oops, I take that back, caught this in post edit. They are now standing down from this weekend's launch attempt for additional inspections before flying one of our fleet leading boosters. As the team continues to drive toward a separate Falcon 9 launch of Starlink from Slick 40 at the end of next week. The next Crewed Dragon mission, Crew 2, is now slated for no earlier than April 20th. They'll be occupying the space station during the next rotation. But we got some really big news that SpaceX announced. Their first 100% commercial passenger mission is coming our way. No earlier than the fourth quarter of 2021, Inspiration 4 will lift off from Pad 39A at Cape Canaveral, Florida to orbit the Earth for a few days with four private passengers in the Dragon capsule. Although they will be monitored by SpaceX, this is pretty much a tourism joyride, the first of its kind that won't be going to the space station. Shift 4 Payments founder Jared Isaacman is funding the trip, and he has purchased the three other seats for future astronauts to join him, each representing a noble attribute of humanity. Jared will command in the leadership seat. A St. Jude Children's Hospital ambassador who exemplifies the pillar of hope will take the second seat. A winner of a St. Jude raffle will win the seat of generosity and a deserving entrepreneur will represent prosperity. Now, if you want to be a part of the crew, those last two seats are available to win through the end of February. Head on over to the Inspiration4 website, link in the description, and choose your way of entering. Donate to the St. Jude Children's Research Hospital and automatically be entered for a chance to win the grand prize, the generosity seat, and thus your ticket to space. Sure, the odds of winning may be small, but keep in mind St. Jude's is helping kids with cancer and other illnesses. So win or lose, you're contributing to a great cause. Godspeed applicants with who I compete against. Okay, so a few months back, I came across this legal complaint filed against SpaceX for you know hiring discrimination practices. But I tossed it aside because that's just not the kind of stuff I like to focus on. But it's now 2021 and a new legal complaint has been filed with Biden's Justice Department. And now heavily widespread throughout the press. Alleging SpaceX wouldn't hire someone based off of their non-US citizenship. Now, I read through all the articles, and not one of them would say what exactly the status of the complainant is. Is he a green card holder, a permanent resident, or an illegal alien? Funny how they don't mention that. I even skimmed through the complaint itself. And yes, skimmed, I don't care for reading legal briefs, and I didn't find anything there either. But what I do know is that SpaceX qualifies as a weapons technologies manufacturer because, you know, they make missiles, we call them rockets, and in 2016, Elon Musk already addressed this issue at his annual Mars colonization presentation with the International Astronautical Congress. Yeah, so I think people are a bit confused about this. Um, unfortunately, it, it, this is not up to us. So the, the U.S. government regulations, um, uh, well, they make, they make um, getting a job in the U.S. hard as it is, just getting a job easy hard as it is. But if you're working on rocket technology, that's considered an advanced weapons technology so even a normal work visa isn't sufficient um, unless you get um, a, a special permission from the Secretary of Defense and, uh, or, the uh, or the Secretary of State. So ITAR, sounds like a reasonable defense to me. But again, I didn't read through the entire brief. So it's a good thing I'm married to a law school valedictorian and 2021 Ohio super lawyer rising star. So I asked her to comment. It's been months since you last saw her, but now she's back and she's pissed off at me. It's the return of the lawyer wife. I don't have time for your frivolous So there you have it. Between this legal case or my existence, one of which is a waste of time and not worth doing. Oh yeah, and one more thing I want to add. So you remember earlier when I said SpaceX basically gave the proverbial finger to the FAA when they launched Starship SN8? Yeah, yeah, I remember. Yeah. <laughs> That was awesome. <laughs> well, they're basically doing the same thing to the DOJ, giving them the finger by refusing to submit subpoenaed records pertaining to the complaint. <laughs> and lastly, SpaceX is saying see you later to another leading member of their team, Hans. Hans! Hans, Vice President of Build and Flight Reliability, is retiring after 19 years with the company. But good news is he will stick around as a part-time technical advisor to SpaceX. Bill Gerstenmaier, recently adopted rocket genius from NASA, will be taking over his role. And now it's time for today's honorable mention. <laughs> 
Avum is building the world's largest aerial drone, capable of launching satellites into space, like a fighter jet launches heat-seeking missiles at Tango's. They recently revealed the Raven X during an online presentation, where their CEO went over all the elements of the program. The fully autonomous drone ship acts as the first stage, carrying the rocket to altitude, all the while communicating with other drone ships and ground communication systems. Then it launches the second stage into space, stage step again, fairing deployment, and then payload deployment. Their primary target customers are those with urgent needs to launch their satellites at a moment's notice, when waiting months would cost more than paying a premium for expediency. Jay Skylis founded the company when he saw the difficulties and communications for the military while trying to recover bodies of American troops. His own brother is a veteran, and now the government is in lockstep with him, gaining the support of the United States Air Force and now the Space Force. I like this guy. He's a go-getter. Well, that's all I have for you guys today. Thank you for tuning in. And shout out to my eccentric members and patrons for supporting the channel. Hope everyone has a nominal weekend. And until next time, Godspeed.